Hi guys, welcome back from summer break. I hope you are all doing well. Today I'll read from a book titled Reciprocal Landscapes, uh, Stories of uh, Material Movements by Jane Hutton, published by Routledge. Hutton is a landscape architect and assistant professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Waterloo in Canada. The book traces five everyday landscape construction materials, fertilizer, stone, steel, trees and wood, from seminal public landscapes in New York City back to where they come from. Drawing from archival documents, photographs and uh, field trips, the author brings these two separate landscapes together, exploring themes of unequal ecological exchange, labor and uh, material flows. Each chapter follows a single materials movement. Guano from Peru that landed in Central Park in the 1860s, granite from Maine that paved Broadway in the 1890s, structural steel from Pittsburgh that reconstructed Riverside Park in the 1930s, London Plain street trees grown on Riker Island uh, by incarcerated workers that were planted in the 7th Avenue north of Central Park in the 1950s, and the popular tropical hardwood ipe uh, from uh, northern Brazil installed in the High Line in the 2000s. Reciprocal landscapes stems uh, from a desire to think of construction materials not as fixed commodities or inert products, but as continuous with the landscapes they come from and with the people that shape them. Hutton's intention is to try to understand materials as fragments of other landscapes as the livelihoods and habitats of people who live near them, as connections between uh, the most tactile aspects of a design and the global circulation of matter driven by capitalism. All the cases in this book have one foot in Manhattan and one foot somewhere else. I'll read from the first chapter. To a blade of grass, access to nutrients means everything. Nitrogen accelerates growth and makes uh, for bright green color. Phosphorus builds uh, stronger roots and winter toughness. And potassium stiffens blades to make a sturdier surface. To Frederick Law Olmsted, carefully fertilizing and improving the soils of Central Park was essential to create the sweeping pastoral landscape that it would become famous for. The success of the turf would impact the beauty and success of the park as a whole. Olmsted experimented with new fertilizers being used in farms at the periphery of the expanding metropolis, including horse manure from street sweepings, uh, night soil from Manhattan privies, manufactured prudret and guano. Of the fertilizers applied uh, to Central Park at the time, guano was the most potent, exotic and novel. Unlike compost, manure and uh, fertilizers incorporating local industrial byproducts, guano was imported from Peru and uh, the South Pacific. This chapter follows a trace amount of Peruvian guano applied uh, to the initial soils of Central Park in the early 1860s. While small in volume, this particular fertilizer application reflects uh, guano's transformative role in farms surrounding New York City and other industrializing metropolis in North America and Europe. The case of guano in Central Park more broadly reflects the growing metabolic rift of the 19th century, as expanding nutrient cycles and enslaved human labor were invisibly yet directly linked to the public landscape. In their 1857 winning competition entry for the design of Central Park, Olmsted and Vo stated that a great purpose of the park was to supply to the hundreds of thousands of tired workers who have no opportunity to spend their summers in the country a specimen of God's handiwork. The park had to counteract the damaging forces of rapid urban growth. It wasn't enough to just introduce plants in the park site. Trees in a row or pots of roses could be found in any urban garden. It wasn't enough to just improve poor air quality, although that was definitely important. By offering natural scenery, the design could impact people's minds and spark their imaginations. Pastoral scenery could do this best. The Sheep Meadow was the park's most literal agricultural simulacra. Sheep were valued as rural curiosities, but also as trimmers and fertilizer. 
sheep graze close to the plant roots, closer than any lawn mower yet devised, and produce a short cropped uh, tough turf, as one New York Times author noted. Their droppings helped the grass grow quickly. While the sheep produce a symbolic image of a farm, their role in the ecological functioning of the soil and grass was part of this image. Manures give plants access to nutrients slowly by changing the quality of the soil. Guano, in contrast, gives plants uh, more highly concentrated nutrients immediately without transforming soil quality or its microbiota. Guano found a commercial market in the New York region by the 1840s and widespread use took off in the 1860s. It was an easily transportable, quick-acting, highly concentrated source of nitrogen. When Olmsted specified guano for Central Park, he did so from experience and out of professional curiosity. He was impressed with the widespread and successful use of guano, and he documented different applications throughout his travels. But while he was excited about guano's power to raise crop yields, Olmsted also cautioned against its careless use. Where ignorantly or improvidently employed, with a thought only of immediate returns, it will probably lead to a still greater exhaustion of the soil and lessen the real wealth of the poor farmer. Guano, in Olmsted's opinion, was an amendment of great value, but real wealth came from a long-term consideration of soil health. Approaching from the coast of Pisco, Peru, the Chincha Islands appear like three giant barnacles latched onto the horizon. The islands, each around one mile across, are part of a guano-coated archipelago that runs along the country's coast. At the height of the Peruvian guano trade uh, from the beginning of the 1840s through the end of the 1870s, millions of seabirds thousands of enslaved Chinese people and scores of ships bound for New York City, Baltimore and European ports swarmed uh, the three islands. The mountains were composed of seabird guano, deposited over millennia, yet depleted within decades. The ships are gone now, and the profile of the islands are unrecognizably shallow. The island is a superactive volume. Granite bedrock forms a stable plateau above the sea, but the mass that lies on top of it continually builds. Birds and sea lions that bask on its beaches, nest on its peaks and inside caves, and dive uh, for fish at its margins literally become the island. Over time, the weight of accumulating guano compacts and concentrates the material to a hard-packed mass. Over four decades following 1840, the so-called guano age, some 10 million tons of guano, valued at half a billion dollars, were exported from the Chincha Islands. A landscape formed by exquisite ecological processes was abstracted and reduced to saleable units. Of the 300,000 tons of guano exported annually from Peru in the 1860s, 40,000 of those landed in New York. As guano increased in value, the mountain was taken down, and it was taken down by hand. A willing labor force for digging guano was not easy to find. Having legally abolished slavery in 1854, Peru found itself without a captive labor force to do the punishing work. Britain had abolished slavery throughout the British Empire in 1833, yet had a great stake in the profit of guano sales. To replace the newly emancipated workforce, Peru and Britain participated in a new form of slavery by hiring Chinese workers under false contracts of free labor. From the mid-1840s uh, through the 1870s, 100,000 men were taken from Chinese ports and sent to Peru's plantations, railroad sites, and, arguably, the cruelest uh, destination, the Wano Islands. The so-called uh, yellow trade was the direct outcome of expanding capital markets facing the end of slavery. But alongside the raising of guano, bird populations suffered. And accustomed to predators, birds were easily slaughtered for food and sport, and their habitats destroyed by the invasive harvesting process. Near the end of the guano boom on the Chincha Islands, bird populations were already scarce. 
that this particular history unfolded on islands is no coincidence. Surrounded by tumultuous waters, the Chincha Islands were impossible to flee. Offshore and far from societal gaze, Guano companies perpetrated slavery under the auspices of countries that had already outlawed it. Peru's Guano Age ended abruptly with the Pacific War of 1879, in which Chile took control of Peru and Bolivia's reserves, steering the world's fertilizer markets towards uh, nitrates and saltpeter, a more abundant uh, nutrient source. Foreseeing the inevitable depletion of nitrates, chemists and capitalists sought synthetic alternatives. By early in the 20th century, Fritz Haber had successfully synthesized ammonia from atmospheric nitrogen, and Karl Bosch had formulated it as a commercial product. The so-called Haber-Bosch process would change the course of global agriculture. A lush, homogeneous lawn soon became the underlay of the American dream. The greener, more neatly shorn and more homogeneous the surface, the better. Chemically fertilized turf grass now pervades the American landscape, from golf courses to Central Park's uh, sheep meadow, covering an estimated 28 million acres. The impacts are enormous. One third of all potable water and 70 million tons of pesticides are drained annually into lawn care. One of the more banal materials in the landscape designer's palette, uh, turf grass, is for many their bread and butter as lawn care amounts to a $30 billion industry. Chemical fertilizers flood the nation's turf and drain into its rivers. Runaway nitrates eventually end up in water bodies, feeding uh, algae and water plants, creating a glut of growth, depleting oxygen and killing off other aquatic life. Invisible and distributed throughout America's most favored landscapes, runoff pollution from lawn fertilizers easily skirts uh, regulation. In Central Park, uh, fertilizer use and grass maintenance uh, has uh, changed over the past century and a half. Park's maintenance uh, practice kept pace with uh, new products and methods from the lawn care industry and included some of their own experimental innovations. During the 1930s, the Park Department established a 27-acre turf laboratory in uh, Pelham Bay Park to test organic and inorganic fertilizer applications, soil mixes and grass seeds uh, for its uh, 10,000 acres of turf. To this day, chemical fertilizers continue to be applied throughout the park. However, there has recently been a growing interest in lower input fertilization techniques, including the composting of the park's own waste. This episode of ecological imperialism transformed the landscapes in different places and in radically different ways. In Central Park and the New York area farms that the park was a metaphor for, Guano improved the soil as had uh, never been seen before, offering better yields, preferred qualities, and most significantly, new expectations for growth. Guano's disappearance stimulated the development of the contemporary chemical fertilizer industry in both agriculture and lawn care, as a central facet of the public landscape. The highly toxic chemicals behind America's lush loans are a well-recognized contradiction of the modern landscape. In the Chincha Islands, the Wano trade transformed the landscape by physically removing most of it, and through the massacre of bird populations disrupted its ability to function as it had. Today, in the Chincha Islands, conservation initiatives are challenged by the legacy of the country's ongoing poverty, with tourism offering one of the few ways forward. Ecotourism in Peru and the lurid high-input modern loan in the United States are the culmination of this material exchange. They are both uh, descendants of idealized uh, landscapes with contradictory pasts. Hatton's research is quite compelling and I really enjoyed her critical analysis. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one.